Hi, John. Today, you and I are going to talk about agency and what we feel will happen beyond agency. There's a, it's a unique time in the auto industry right now with the business model under pressure from so many fronts. His experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Maybe to kick things off, can you just explain what is agency and how it actually works and how does it compare to the existing model for distribution in automotive? Great question, John. Right now, as we said earlier, there's a lot happening in disruption in the automotive industry. And when we look at the franchise business model, I think it's good to get an understanding first and foremost what we have and where we're going to, and then where it's most likely going to develop beyond that. Because we're both of us of the view that agency is basically a stepping stone to another place, if you like, or a combination of what we'll see in the distribution channel. Right now, for many years, over 100 years, we've had the franchise business model. And the franchise business model was really championed by Henry Ford because Henry Ford was a very smart operator. He was an astute businessman. He knew that he had a factory. If he could get the factory and the cost of production down, that factory could churn our cost-effective vehicles and he could provide a vehicle, affordable vehicle to the masses. So Henry Ford wanted to get the vehicles out to the masses at an affordable price. So how do you do that? Because customers don't necessarily buy when the factory is producing or in line with the factory's production schedule. So Henry realized that he needed money to buy his materials. So he's very astute and all car companies are very astute with purchasing. They have incredibly large procurement and purchasing departments, all about getting costs down in production. Now, when you the biggest cost is actually engineering and designing a vehicle. It takes many years and many billions of dollars to engineer and design a vehicle to bring it to market and have it homologated. So those engineering costs need to be sunk over a fair bit of time. So the average is between six to eight years of a model cycle. You'll get updates that occur during that time, whether it's sheet metal updates or trim updates, etc., model year updates. But fundamentally, that vehicle that is designed will run its course for up to eight years. So a lot of cost has to be sunk. Then you've got the cost down in producing. So what you tend to carry over is some tech, you introduce new tech along the way, but most tech is carried over in some way, shape or form and has done so for a long period of time. We've evolved the internal combustion engine. It's got more and more efficient as the years have passed, but the cost to tweak it as opposed to totally throw it away and do something different have, have been very small in the previous years. Whereas now we've got a situation where we're saying, all right, internal combustion away, we're going EV. So this is the next challenge. So the costs of those EV components, primarily batteries, motors not so much, but primarily batteries, are high, higher than what the component costs are for an ICE vehicle. So here we are, we have a vehicle that costs more to make, and you've got all that engineering cost that you need to sink into the vehicle. Now, let's go back to the franchise model. With the franchise model, with those sunk costs, the factories produce these vehicles, they pump them out into the marketplace. There's margins in it for the OEM, the manufacturer. There's margins in it for the dealer. And there's some negotiation that happens along the way. Right now, not a lot of negotiation. It's all about can I get a car or not? That's the great thing, if you can actually supply one. But in a normal market, supply equals demand or sometimes exceeds. And this is where the franchise business model is so important to the OEMs. When there's an oversupply, the factory still needs to maintain its efficiency but it's producing more cars than what the market needs. So what the, the OEM needs in order to keep cash coming in is to wholesale a car to the dealers. And this is where they use the dealer network as a financial buffer where they'll push stock into the dealers. The dealers will pay interest in floor plan 
uh, on those vehicles and that helps the factory continue to produce more vehicles and engineer more cars for the future. What we're seeing with the advent of EVs is the OEMs, the manufacturers, are looking at it saying, well, we don't have the margin anymore to give the dealer a margin for them to make out of the car. So we need to take some of their profit and use it to help subsidize the cost of this extra vehicle. Otherwise, the cost will still of the vehicle at retail if the margins were maintained would be high or higher even more so than what they are now. So in order to make EVs acceptable and for everybody to be profitable, the OEMs need to go to a different business model. So that's why the question's asked, what does it look like? So a couple of things have happened. So that's the cost pressure side of what's happening from a franchise versus agency. The timing works well because we as consumers are changing. The franchise business model was great because the OEM had no relationship with Mr. and Mrs. Retail who would buy the cars. They would kind of have some data on them, but realistically, they relied on the businessman on, or person on the ground who had a relationship with the local market. They give them targets called a, a, within a PMA, Prime Marketing Area, that they've got to look after and achieve certain KPIs in. They need customer service, they need to have good uh, sales experience, good service experience, etc. So here we have a situation where the dealers were doing all the engaging with the customer, the OEM was supplying cars to the dealer. Okay, there's a brand, so the brand is the story. The dealer is the person on the ground with the relationship doing the transaction and hopefully maintaining that relationship and selling more cars and selling more parts. That's the win for the OEM. The win for the dealer is they make profit out of all of that too. So that's the big bonus. Now, what's happened as time has progressed from the Henry Ford days, they were newspapers back then. Now there's this thing called the online environment and globalization. Previously, you were in your little town, you didn't cross over to the other suburb, you didn't know what the other dealer was necessarily doing over there, you might drive over to check what they're doing. Now, you can move around and shop around and you can put price pressure down when there's an oversupply situation. But also you can find out more about what is going on and what's available. So we've, the world has become smaller, the PMAs are blurred as to what is a PMA for a dealer, and then there's the other challenge as well, what, do I, as if I'm the car company, I can now communicate more effectively with my end user. I can promote my brand and tell a story about what I've engineered and what I've produced, and, but I still need a third party to help execute that little bit, that last mile, if you like, of the delivery. But I'm now closer to the customer than I ever was, say 20, 30, 40 years ago as an OEM. So here we are, we're closer to customers, Close, or OEMs are closer to customers, dealers are still close to customers, but now there's cost pressures, cost pressures, and there's an acceptance for customers to now buy online. The pandemic has accelerated that, we knew it would. So we've all gone and bought lots of clothes online and lots of electronic items online, and we're buying used cars online, and we're now buying new cars online. New cars are probably the least risky because you've got a warranty behind it, you know what it is, and you can determine what price it is. So it makes sense from a consumer perspective to introduce agency. Downside is haggling's gone. So this is the, uh, the upside for a, say, a dealer or even the OEM is that uh, the haggling's not there and some customers don't like to haggle. In fact, there's a lot of customers that don't like to haggle. There are those that must haggle in order to feel that they've had a win. So you've got this dichotomy of win-lose. Every, every action has a positive consequence and a negative consequence. So that's the re, re, where we're at right now with this transition from franchise to agency. So putting the perspective, cost pressures are still going to be there. Right now we've got a situation where we don't have an oversupply situation, we're going to undersupply. So the OEMs are moving their stock into the dealers and the dealers are selling them straight away. That's a nice, smooth, easy way for agency too, where it just can go in straight out. The challenge will be for the OEMs when the factories start overproducing versus what the market is prepared to take of that particular car. And no one gets it right all the time. Not everyone designs the perfect car that everyone wants to buy based on your production schedule. That's the fact of life. Yes, there'll be needs for transportation, but ultimately as more and more choice becomes available, 
the market becomes more selective and the 4P market winners will be there. The product, the price, the place and the, and the uh, promotion will be the winners. Those brands that have the product that's slightly off or the promotion slightly not right, uh, they will have inventory that will build up and that's when the pressures will start to kick in. So Mark, what do you think those pressures will be in between a high volume market and low market? How will the two markets compare for an agency, an OEM that's an agency? It's a very good question, John, because it's it, it really, we, we, we sometimes we overcomplicate this industry. It's really about product meeting the expectations being told a message in a way that makes sense to what the product, that there's congruence between the product and what it's standing for and what it actually does, the price of that product and the availability for the consumer to buy that product. So access to cash and finance is critical, whether it be your own finance, whether it be finance available from the dealer or the prevailing interest rates, etc. So when credit becomes difficult to get, demand will slow. Now, the other side of the coin is manufacturing and production. We talked before about the traditional model of manufacturing. It takes many years to gear up, to design, to procure all the components to build a vehicle. That is still going. It's a bit like a train as it's coming down the, road, down the track. That train is getting gaining pace across the world in the EV space. Still taking some time to get there, but it's gaining pace. The factories need to get production up so that they can be more efficient. And that's how they make money. So they've got to have costs down. So they're ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. They've seen all these carryover orders. They need to keep building, building, building to meet those orders so they can get cash. Because ultimately it's cash flow for the OEM. And this is where the, when, you, when that crossover occurs of supply and the demand crossing over where there's now more supply than the demand, that's when you'll start to see pricing pressure come down. And the behavior of the whole agency model will change. Because right now, new cars are on the agency model based with the price predicated by the OEM. Used cars are laissez-faire. It's an open market. Used cars are the demand of the dealer. And what we'll start to see with the agency model when there's an oversupply situation occurring and it will happen, and in fact, we're seeing some signs of it with some of the brands, is the return of the fabled demonstrator sale. Because if you recall the new car agency model, there's no negotiation. So here we have the situation where when supply exceeds demand and the factories have inventory, the agency model predicates that the new car price is controlled by and set by the OEM, whereas used cars are the dealer's domain and the market and the dealers set the price. So what we're starting to see already where there's some stock building up in some of the brands that have gone the agency model is the need for them to push uh, demonstrators. So the new car still will be set at the agency price with the agency fixed uh, margin for the dealer to deliver on behalf of the OEM. But what we'll also be starting to see is that the demonstrators or ex-factory cars that were used to promote the vehicles in the agency model will be sold en masse as demonstrators. So that'll be still the traditional model that we have now where the dealer owns those cars and can push those demonstrators out at a discounted price. And that way, that product is differentiated from a new car, which is sold as agency. So the agency price will be, say, set at $60,000, but that same car as a demonstrator may be sold at 50 because it's got a thousand kilometers. So what you're saying in effect, dealer will be in a similar situation to what he is now. So the impact of agency will not have such an impact on him as some have anticipated. Is that correct? Or? Potentially. It, the, there's no doubt that the new car margin side has changed. But this, I'm talking about the situation when the agency situation has an oversupply. So let's be clear on that, that it's not all the time because if, the, if there's low supply, the agent will just deliver the vehicle and, and get the agent's margin. But when the, age, when the dealer has, or when the OEM has an oversupply, they will have to push it. Now that still doesn't mean that the deal will make more money. That just means that the model is a hybrid of agency and, 
uh, the franchise model, where the dealer still uses their entrepreneurial flair to move out those demonstrator vehicles. And some dealers have a bigger appetite than others. And right now, the used car market's been quite buoyant. So there'd be a lot of action around that as far as uh, getting, if, if you could get a hold of some excess demonstrators, you'd like to push those out because you'll make, in theory, you should be making good money. The reality is, if you look at the Deloitte data, the, the dealer margins on used cars are compressing already because of the higher price that you need to pay to get the stock. And there's also price pressure coming down already on the supply for used. Uh, in fact, there's a re recent report today that showed that used car price, uh, prices have actually dropped uh, for the first time in quite some time uh, in this market. So, but not significantly, but there is a, there is a downward move. So this is where the supply catching up in new will start to put more pressure below. When that will happen, and the degree it will happen will all come down to how much production occurs and also how much tightening in the finance space for buyers to be able to afford new vehicles or newer vehicles, because that slows down the demand. So if you slow down the demand with interest rates and a lack of availability to credit, and you increase the supply of stock coming in with new brands coming in and new products coming in and, and, and forecasts, inventory coming in that was ordered 12 months ago that suddenly isn't sold because those orders have fallen over, that's when you'll start to see some pricing pressure. Now, to say that it's gonna be profitable for one or another, I don't think so, uh, because it usually comes down to how are you gonna sell this? And this is where there's a risk that the agency model may flounder if it's not done or executed correctly, because when we get to this situation, there'll be the showcase to say, hey, we should maybe go back to this business model or franchise because that's how it's working anyway. Having said that, I personally don't think that will happen because I think you'll find that the costs associated with bringing these new models in and amortize that engineering, the OEMs just can't afford to do that and, and give away that much or that, that much margin given their costs are still under a lot of pressure. Now, Mark, we've gone to some brands that started to go to the agency model now. What do you think is going to be the impact on showrooms? Because with them going across the agency now, they've benefited from the franchise model where dealers were required to put up these big showrooms. But under the agency model, they're just going to be delivering vehicles on behalf of the OEM. So do you think there's going to still be big showrooms or what will it just be delivery centers much smaller? Or how do you think it's going to work? There's an argument for both. A, you don't need for new facilities, but you want to maintain your existing at least and you still want to maintain standards because the OEM wants, the whole point of agency is that the OEM wants to have the best experience because the OEM wants to feel closer to the customer. They're paying the agent to deliver, so they're taking the pain. The pain point for the dealer, which agency fixes, is floor plan. And we had a great podcast just recently with Alan Crouch, who outlined how floor plan works when dealers finance vehicles. Now, in the dark days pre-pandemic, now, dealers had some some dealers were carrying cars for over 12 months. Now, if you're paying four and five percent interest on a car on a, on a sixty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar car for more than 12 months, that margin that you were hoping to make out of that car, if your profit margin was at best five percent, it's gone in interest. And then you've got to sell that vehicle as a depreciated asset. So you've torn up money on that car. So that's and and that's not a one or two great brands don't usually have those problems, but a lot of the uh, uh, boutique brands do when, the, when you have an oversupply situation, because it doesn't take many cars to be oversupplied if you're a, 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 a boutique brand. And we're talking boutique brands, anything from brand uh, number 15 and beyond in the, uh, on the rankings. So floor plan savings are a big winner for the dealer when there's an oversupply and if you're on agency. Agency doesn't help you when there's no supply and floor plan's not a cost, which is where we're at right now. So this is where the, the, the pressures come into play as to what there's winners and losers with both, both business models. Now, Mark, going forward, you're starting to see the different types of retail models. They see in subscription and car share. What's the difference between subscription and car share? Can you explain that to us? Well, yes, we had a subscription on our show, actually, John, if you recall one of our earlier shows. Uh, we had Carbar uh, on 
as far as explaining this, the subscription model. And subscription is, is a way of owning a car without owning a car. You're buying a subscription to have access to a car that you have, that you don't have to own that physical engine number, chassis number. You're driving X amount of dollars worth of car per week, per month that you're subscribing to, and you can change that car over. If there's a problem with the car, you just swap it for another car. When you buy a car, you own that car and you need to get that car fixed. Whereas with subscription, you are getting a car of a certain model. You don't necessarily have to like the color because the color is not, it's, you're not actually married to that car like you are if you bought it or were financing it. So that's the beauty of subscription and you can change the car to suit your lifestyle. So you just work out on a dollars per week, dollars per month. This is how much I want. To, or I'm prepared to spend on, on having access to transport. And that's the car that's going to be in my driveway or in my garage or in my car park down below. And that's the, that's the choice from a subscription perspective. It's a beautiful model. It's very clever. It gives you flexibility. But it was interesting just talking to the guy when we, when we were speaking with uh, uh, the guys at, uh, at Carbar. A lot of those subscriptions still ran more than 12 months. So you, you, you weren't necessarily changing your car every month. Like the, the dream of swapping over is that you know, I'll, I'll, this month I feel like a convertible, next month I'll go for an SUV. You can do that, but there's, uh, there's a bit of work and there's some costs involved in doing that. But that's the beauty, you get flexibility. You're not married to a car that's, you've paid all these costs and then you're depreciating it, then you get to dispose of it and all that sort of stuff. It's a nice, easy way. Here's a set of keys, drive the car, pay your money, hand the keys back, get another car. It's a really nice system. And if you look at car share, that's a different process. That's where you just need a car for a certain amount of time. You sign up for car share. You then have to book that car when it's available to suit your needs. Subscription, the car's yours all that time. With car share, it's not. You have to make a booking. You drive the car when you when you need it and when and you need to bring it back to where it needs to be for the next person. With subscription, you don't have that problem. The subscription, you park it where you want to park it. You're responsible for it. From a car share perspective, you've got to take it back to the designated places and so it's, it can be re-rented, uh, if you like, uh, to another person. So different people are driving that car. Subscription, you're the person driving that car. So Mark, going forward, what do you think the business model will be in the, in the future? Because we've seen it's gone from franchise to agency. Do you think it'll move beyond agency? What's your feeling on that? I think we'll see a combination of, there'll be some brands that will just embrace the franchise business model and maintain it. Because it's simplicity, it works, and it helps your cash flow. If you're the OEM, it helps gives the deal a certainty in how to conduct business. So there's no surprises with, with the franchise model. It's worked for 100 years. It's, it, it will work for some brands, continue on. Agency makes sense for other brands that, that have high costs and want to get and, and want to pivot closer to be closer with their customers and have the infrastructure in place to do so. We had a really good podcast uh, probably about four or five months ago, John, where who owns the customer? So is it the OEM? Is it the dealer? So from an agency perspective, the customer is owned. It's the closer ownership is with the OEM. The dealer is an agent, but the dealer still is a party to this and can still influence the customer to potentially go for another brand because we know most dealers are not sole brands anymore. They're not sole franchises. So this is the other dichotomy for the OEMs that are going agency is that the dealers can still switch customers from brand to brand depending on where they're going to get a better return and, uh, and what's the least line of resistance for that customer. So that's, that's some of the challenges that OEMs are always going to have. As much as they would like to think, well, I've got, that I've got a, a unique product, they get all excited with and say, well, no, I'm going to, people are going to buy mine. That there, I think there's a trap, there's a, there's a lull of a false sense of security with agency right now that it's going to be so easy because there's no stock and people are lining up to buy your cars. It's when there's an oversupply, we will see agency really put under pressure. And that's when it's actually better for dealers when, agent, when the oversupply situations. Agency is a good thing. It is a good thing. But this is where the OEMs and also dealers, the, the opportunity that really arises here, because this, this podcast is all about what are the, what's the current state, future state. 
And if you think of the opportunities are very much in either the dealer or the OEM leveraging a subscription product to actually then get the vehicles out to the customer. Because we talked about the customers are, uh, are more attuned digitally, they're more attuned to dollars per week. If you can provide a solution that then gives a transportation solution to a customer where that product can be moved around, and as long as you've got a situation now where residual values are still good, you can generate the used car business that will help the dealers in the used car side of things, because that's the demand of the dealer to sell used cars. And you can use subscription to move new cars into the top of the funnel where you can get large scale um, uh, product acceptance at a digestible price point, which is the dollars per week or dollars per month from an agency perspective, sorry, from a subscription perspective. And then the vehicles are offloaded back through your agent who then remarkets them as used cars. And this is where uh, utilizing the flipper car product, which is one of our other podcasts, uh, the flipper car product fits really well into defleeting that, aid, that subscription vehicle into the used car market and then getting the best price for that in the wholesale market to then move it on. And these are some of the interconnectivities if you think of agency, subscription, dealer, flipper car, remarketing, and then that service cycle continues back on again with the dealer having service work and the customer being retained in the family sees the new subscription they can potentially get. They've been driving a used car. Maybe even the dealer can use a subscription service on those low kilometer or the, the near new cars that have just come off subscription from the OEM. They then have their own subscription service or have a subscription service that they use straight from the OEM on new vehicles. So there's lots of opportunities where subscription fits in really well with both used cars and that flipper car product to make sure you get the, the best uh, resale value for the vehicle and the cars go to where they need to go, not hoarded in some spots and, uh, and customers get the best experience in defleeting their vehicle de or dehorsing themselves out of that vehicle and getting another vehicle. Because this is the beauty of both, all these systems, if you think about it, it's basically, here's a set of keys, change over, how much am I paying? Can I afford it? Do I have access to funds? And just where you go. Because Mark, I think with cars becoming electric vehicles, you're going to find it a lot more difficult to differentiate between products. They're going to become more homogenous. It then will make the subscription model more attractive because all you're doing is providing a mobility solution. What do you think about that? That's a really good point, John, because when you think about it now, you think of all the cars that are out on in the market, and there's what over 60 brands in this country. Uh, you know, globally, there'd be you know, hundreds. So when you think of the the vehicles, they're unique. And we, we'll go back to you know we, we talked about the uh, how an, an internal combustion engine or vehicle gets designed. So it's engine, it's transmission, it's drivetrain, noise and vibration, it's the suspension, it's the the body dynamics and the harmony of the of those pistons. Uh, whizzing up and down the camshafts, the drive, the drive belt, or the timing gears, or the timing chains—all these things make and the induction sounds, the, the tuned ports on the inlet, the tuned ports on the exhaust, the composition of the engine—all these things make a unique sound. You know, you listen to the beautiful sound of a Maserati; it just sings. You know, a, a Porsche sounds amazing, right? Or a big V8, you know, beautiful. Uh, uh, Hemi V8, you know, these things sound incredible, or a Boss Mustang, you know, these are things you've got to be very proud of. So all those notes are what buyers differentiate, the, the car feels, the rumble, the vibration, the exhaust, the intake, just the sound of the engine, the transmission, how it shifts, the different feel. It's the feelings that you get in your car, it's what you feel through the steering wheel, feel through the seat, feel through the, the gear levers, the pedals, etc. These are the vibrations that are unique to each and every internal combustion engine. They're very different. But when you now take all that away and you have a beautifully harmonized electric motor, it is so smooth. And yes, there'll be some degrees of slight different degrees of whirring sounds that are different from one car to the next because of slightly different gearing in the whirring of the electric motors. But ultimately, it's very quiet. 
So you're homogenizing that automotive experience that we've all kind of gotten used to and taken for granted. And that's what we, our, our primal mind actually says, I like this car or I don't. Because it's when people say, I don't like the feel of this car. What is it you don't feel? It's you, most of the time, it's actually the vibe from the car. It's the Marbo of the car. It's the vibe. So, and that is all driven by all those components that create, that are needed for an internal combustion engine to be vehicle, to be propelled and operate. So the homogenization is definitely gonna happen. So it'll then just be the tech in the car. So if you look at EVs, there's a race to max out the tech in it. Like they're just basically giant iPads on wheels. And they've got everything that you could imagine to just stimulate your mind. But ultimately, that's, that's just, that will get to a point where, okay, yes, this iPad is this big, or the, the whole dash is the whole iPad. How cool is that? Temperature control, all that. So that's going to be quickly homogenized. It's going to be a quiet vehicle. They're going to drive nicely. They're all running on tires that are quiet and smooth. So right now, it's going to be the design of the vehicle, the type of vehicle. I want an SUV. I want a convertible. I want a, a small car. And this is where the subscription model will really come into play because it's like, oh, I'm going to feel the same thing, whether it's a EV SUV to an EV small car. So I will pop around with what I want to get because it's what suits my life at the time. Because ultimately the car has to fit in with our lifestyle. That's why we have them. There's a little bit of luxury to them. There's something that's, that we'd like to spoil ourselves to a certain extent, but ultimately we have to have a car to get around. We don't, it's not a luxury to have someone transport us around all the time. Although, having said that, then there's Uber too. So, so we've, we've now moved on from the pandemic. We're not so worried about the germs anymore. So you know, there's the other risk again, that you, uh, you, you'll either be a person who owns or subscribes, or you'll be a, just a user and get driven around. So John, with all this in mind, we've talked about franchise agency and we've talked about subscription car share Uber. So here we have the transition from OEM making, wholesaling, dealer, buying, selling, trading, do and doing the legwork here. Now we've got customers that are coming in directly to the OEM, transacting online, agency, dealer delivers the car on their behalf. Sometimes the deal is not even a deal. The agent's not even a deal. The agent could be a third party that just delivers on behalf of the OEM. So the OEM's now closer to the customer. Is this the, is beyond agency, the OEM engaging the subscription service to do all that for them? Yeah, Mark, I think the subscription service is definitely going to play a major part in the future. And the very simple reason is for an OEM and dealer, normally the customer transitions away to service at independent service workshops. It can start anything from three, four years up to seven, eight years. Most customers transition away at the end of the warranty period. I think having subscription is going to help the, both the OEM and the dealer retain that customer for a lot longer period. Because part of that subscription is that your maintenance is included and insurance so you all your repairs and that so you'll check the car every year you'll pick up the car get it service do any repairs on the vehicle for if it's been dented or anything's happened to the car and changes tires because tires and that is all included previously the dealers and the oems have have lost all that tire business or that insurance business because that happens elsewhere at panel beaters and that so a lot of that business they can bring back and retain and make a margin on that, even though they're putting it out to panel beaters themselves. So I think it's going to allow them to maybe, I don't think they want to retain a car maybe after 10 or 12 years, but to allow them to keep it up to 10 or 12 years through the subscription, first tier subscription, a new car, and then a second tier subscription on that medium second hand car for, for different markets. Yes, yeah, that's that's a very good point because you can if the if the parties get involved and this is where the there still will be a need for individuals to own vehicles and I think that's a fundamental there's just those that just want to own that's my car I own it but then I'm responsible for it as I say I'm responsible to get it serviced and maintained whereas with with subscription it's I'm paying for it anyway but 
someone else is actually doing it. So it feels like I'm not paying for it. As you say, if I need to get a set of, set of tires put on the vehicle. So uh, the other question is, is it an opportunity then for the OEM to deal directly with the subscription service and not even have dealers? And that's where the dealers then aren't necessarily agents. They are just used car dealers. So the if you want to buy brand X, you have to buy it as a subscription and we will get someone to drop it around to you and we'll get the paperwork done. And that subscription service has someone who uh, concierges the vehicle to your house, hands over the documentation, gives you the set of keys, the car's nice and clean, and they're off. The Uber picks them up and takes them away. You've got your car. And when the time comes to hand your car back, that person gets dropped off in an Uber, they come across, they pick up your car and they drive it away. Or they bring your replacement car, give you the set of keys, take you the set of keys away, and you never actually go to a dealership. They facilitate everything. I think that hybrid version can happen, but I think the big advantage is for the actual dealers and the OEMs to manage that themselves. And I think with them taking grasp for that business, they'll make it more difficult for some of the subscription services to stay in business. I'm talking about long term, I don't think that's going to happen overnight. So I don't think every OEM can become a, will provide a full subscription service from day one. But I think it will be worth them getting into it and saying, okay, over so many years, I want to be doing 50% of the business or 60% of the business in subscription. And having the dealers involved, because they'll be doing the repair work and the changing of the tires and the, all that other stuff that needs to be done. It makes sense to still keep the dealers involved uh, because there's revenue for everybody to be, be made out of that model. It's an in interesting idea. It's an interesting idea and it'll be interesting to watch this space. I don't believe anything that this will happen anytime soon as far as a revolution. One thing history has taught us, we always think, think, think things in the short term will happen faster than what they do, but we also think the long term is longer than what it actually is. So what we expect to be a long term thing usually comes to bear earlier than anticipated and the things that we say will happen now take longer than anticipated. So yeah, the hybrid version is definitely changing. There's, there's going to be a mix of the franchise, agency, subscription will get bigger. Car share, pandemics in the rear vision mirror, so we're not so worried about jumping into Ubers anymore. Uh, so these models will continue to grow and there will be a decline in outright ownership because once again, it comes down to what's getting credit as well. Uh, if you can't necessarily finance a vehicle, but you may be able to get a, a subscription to a vehicle and then potentially upgrade it while you're there. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you got as much out of the conversation as we did. We did some brainstorming and we uh, see some very interesting times in the next five to 10 years. The short term will be one of disruption as we morph out of pandemic induced shortages and pandemic pandemic induced uh, buyer behavior into what the future state will be and the acceptance of subscription agency a mix with franchise and more uh, car share and uh, other alternative ride share if you like what you heard please remember to subscribe to our channel ring the bell so you get notified of new videos and look out for us on itunes and spotify Thanks very much for listening.